Okay, we're recording. So welcome to you, Nima, and to everyone who's watching to uh, the second coaching session with Nima Salami. You're going to be speaking uh, at TEDx Delft Award on the 26th of March. That's in 12 days. How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Josh and everyone. Um, yes, I am feeling super excited. Uh, I have to be honest and say, hey, I actually feel very stressed as well. Yeah. But I think as we're getting closer, for some reason, my stress is decreasing. Mm -hmm. Maybe that has to do with that, the fact that you said you have to practice more. And I've been yeah. trying to practice a little bit. And that helps with reduction of stress. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. How many times have you been able to practice since our last session two days ago? Um, yeah, so I did it once to myself. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it counts. I think yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I had the opportunity to give a short version of my talk to two friends today separately. So three times in total. Okay, great. That's still so, three times, three, what do, how do we call it? A, a triple time uh, improvement to the last time that I had zero practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, infinity percent improvement, I think. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Um, so, great. So, um, do you want to just pitch it once to me and then, um, and then I'll give you feedback and we can work on it? Oh, sure. Sounds good. Um, and uh, is it okay if I stand and do it? Because yeah. when I'm sitting down, I feel like I am a little bit not comfortable enough. I don't know. No, Does good. it make sense? That that makes I, more, it's more natural. That's how you'll be giving it on stage. That makes sense. That is true. Exactly. So let me see if I could put it a bit further. So. Okay. Okay. Um, five minutes. Is that a good time for you? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this I time I'm going to... You can do seven minutes, or, but do, or do you prefer me to keep it at five minutes? Yeah, because you uh, usually during practice, you'll speak faster than what you'll do on stage. So I, uh -huh. I like to time myself a little bit less than what I end up doing so that I don't, don't overrun. So okay, okay. We could, I would say, let's keep practicing for a couple, for five, and then we can increase the practice to six, and I would keep it at six. I wouldn't practice for seven because you, you just have a risk that you'll overrun the time. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to hold it up here so you'll see it. Um, yeah. People watching won't see it when while you're talking because they'll just see whoever's talking. So, um, But um, ready? Yes. Okay, then you can start. All right. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start with a cliche. So I'm going to ask you two very simple questions, and I need your cooperation with me. First question is, who among you in the audience has ever traveled in their life? Yeah, you could see almost the whole crowd. Uh, let's go one step further. How many of you here has ever migrated in their lives? Well, yeah, we could see there is a good international vibe here. Well, I'm also one of you. I have migrated to Netherlands around five years ago. And as with any other uh, new be in Netherlands, I had to go through some scanning and have to go through the doctor and physician and have to tell them about my health. Uh, they note it down and then I'm good to go. Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple for everyone. Some people suffer from more critical health problems and they have to go to the doctor and make the doctor understand about their health issue. And it's not usually that easy. Maybe you have to go several times um, and then there's some maybe even language barriers. For some people that have some very critical health situation, they have to do this as soon as possible. But these screenings and tests and talk with the doctor usually take even months. But let's talk about my mom, for example. She has, she's suffering from several um, health issues, including back problem. Uh, she has asthma. Let's take her asthma problem, for example. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you has ever uh, had asthma. Well, the statistics says around 12 out of 100 people suffer from asthma. So maybe around 10% of the people here could be suffering from asthma. Or maybe you have, see a friend or a neighbor or a relative who is suffering from this. I don't know if you have ever witnessed this, and I hope you have not. But when asthma attack happens, it would get very dangerous the person who's suffering might 
go through a very awful experience, sometimes even near-death experience, coughing your lungs out. Unfortunately, that was the case with my mom. She suffered from a couple of asthma attacks while she was waiting for the doctors to understand their problem. Her doctor was not a believer of asthma. She, he was keep trying to make her uh, believe that, nay, that there's no asthma. After two months, he finally was convinced that he could send my mom to a specialist, an expert, to do some real health tests. And after a couple of weeks of testing, they were finally convinced that my mom is suffering from this problem and finally give her the medication that she needs. But until then, she faced several times of asthma attack and near-death experience, which is horrible to say the least. And I hope none of you here has ever experienced that or seen somebody go through that. So as a computer science student, I came to this point that was like, there should be a technological solution to this. And I want to make that. After doing some research, I just, th I just thought, why not we have a digital health platform where people's health data could be uploaded there, stored there, and can be accessible in different places? But that immediately raised the question, hey, what if the data gets stolen? As a computer scientist, again, I am always worried, hey, what if the data is stolen or is being put into the wrong people's hand? So I have to think a bit harder, do a bit more research, and I saw that it is possible. We have reached the point now that there are different ways of storing data safely and giving access only to the people who are authorized. One way of doing this is using a technology called blockchain, which is very complex, and we don't want to talk about all the details of how blockchain works here, but to say it simply is that it allows you to share data in a decentralized manner, and that by itself means everybody could have access to the data, they cannot alter the data, but they could see it in different places while it is not in the hand of only one authority who might manipulate it or use it for wrong reasons. So using a technology like blockchain or many other advances that we have had nowadays, you're able to make this possible. So you go to a doctor, you give your fingerprint scanner, then by using your biometrics to give access of your data to the doctor or the organization you need anywhere in the world. This is something we could make, we could, this is something we could make it happen now and it is possible. And I want to invite all of you here in the audience, no matter what background you're coming from, no matter what you believe in, I'm sure you believe in the health of everyone, and let's do it together. Thank you. Okay. Oh, five cool. minutes of story. I had a lot of things in my mind that I couldn't say, that I said the last two times I was giving it to the friends. <laughs> okay, how did you time it last time? Was it seven minutes timing? Exactly seven minutes. Two both one was six minutes and 30 seconds one was six minutes and 45 seconds okay so still less than seven minutes but there were like a lot of important things that i had to get rid of yeah. now <laughs> yeah so that that's fine because uh we, we need to think a little bit more about the structure more broadly so if you would break down this talk into um segments like what was the main segments how would you break it down I think my introduction was maybe too long. Um, no, no, no. I don't. <laughs> what? No. The, 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 I don't want you to, to evaluate it right now. I just want you to group it into segments. Just uh, what was what? Because I, I wrote down a, a few that I noticed, and I but I would like your kind of perception first. What's the flow of it? Is there how many parts are there? You know. Um, okay, I, I didn't structure it in my mind um, in a formal way, but I yep. think the first part was kind of grabbing the audience attention, making them feel relating to something, related to something. Um, then sharing the story with them and try to make them understand the situation and also maybe some of the people can relate again. Then define a problem with some more details. And that took around maybe 60%, 70% of the, the talk. Then only I introduced that, that hey, I, I want to solve this problem and I, and there are different ways of doing it. Then going a little bit details, but a very short ending and invite to the people to come and help make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
defining the problem, that's something actually, so you said you spend a lot of time defining the problem. That's something I think we need to actually work on. Um, can you just briefly uh, tell me again, what, how do you define the problem? Um, by saying that there are a lot of people traveling or migrating that need access to their data abroad um, when they go to different places. Mm -hmm. And otherwise they have to tell what is their problem from the beginning every time they migrate. This was a bit more obvious the last other times I gave it in seven minutes. Yeah. I tried to shorten it, but then I cut off some parts that I think were critical. Yeah, and and the thing is as well that, um, like we talked about the last time, you need to make it more relevant to the people sitting in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, most people just cannot imagine something very specific when they are thinking about um, traveling or migrating. Well. Mm -hmm. You, you know anyway that the majority of people in that room will not have had a migration experience. And so um, the question is, can they imagine themselves requiring medical care on traveling while traveling? And probably they can't because probably it has never happened to them. So that doesn't mean it won't happen, but you need to make it very visual for them. You need to help them imagine, give them statistics, give them some information about what is the the chance of them requiring medical attention while traveling. Mm. That is true. That's also something exactly we talked about last time. One thing I noticed is that we are in Delft and in TU Delft and there are already a lot of internationals. So that's why I kind of let myself talk about this, this migration thing a bit more because I thought, okay, there's actually at least maybe 30% of the people sitting in the room are migrants here. And, um, even that, at least many of them have traveled far from where their home was, even in Netherlands, to come here. And they also had to have their data, uh, health data, from a different organization to a new organization where they had to move. That was a testimony I heard from two Dutch people also today. Um, but if you think that maybe we have to find a different way of making people care more, then... Because I, yeah. I found well, some statistics. Yeah, so you, you, I think you need to show the statistics. And the other thing is you need to mention that about the difficulty within the Netherlands that you have to transfer data and that that's not that easy because mm -hmm. that's actually a way better use case for your technology than traveling internationally because that's something that a lot more people do. Um, uh, sorry, one second. Um, so mm -hmm. you said... Um, emphasize on also the problem the local people would have yeah so um yeah so you need so as i understand it now there's three kind of groups there's people who are migrating there's people who are traveling in another country who might have a medical emergency in another country and there's people who are moving within the netherlands who might need to transfer their data from one um, doctor to another or from yeah, yeah. although um, yeah. there is a solution to that locally mm -hmm. which is called EPD so it's mm -hmm. kind of the same idea yeah. but a, a bit more dumbed down very simple version but only still only specific organization have that so not every general physician have access to to such system right so even though the, the, something similar exists in Netherlands first of all it's local only to the Netherlands secondly not every place has it yes so, um, but that's a challenge that you're going to face too, right? If the doctors have to implement some software that you create, well, most of them are not going to do that. And I know it's the same here in Switzerland. They passed a law, uh, exactly the EPD law that requires um, hospitals to have EPD software, uh, mm. but only starting in like five years or something. Mm. And um, it's only required for hospitals and for doctors, uh, private practice, it's all optional. Mm -hmm. And um, even at hospitals, the patient has to opt in. So the patient has to opt in. Uh, the hospital has to provide it if the patient wants it. With a private practice, the doctor has to pro provide it. That's opt in. Mm -hmm. And the patient also has to opt in. So most private practice doctors exactly. will not actually do it. That's just a fact. They just, the technology is just, they don't want to change their software and whatever. And I know a little bit about this because I met with one of the companies that provides software with uh, to uh, doctors. Yeah. And they said, this is not, not going to happen. We're not going to implement this in our software anytime soon. Um, oh. because our doctors don't want it. So, um, 
So the, the question is, can your solution be made possible for people, even if the doctors do not participate? One way to think about that is to say, well, a, a patient has the right to all the information that the doctor keeps anyway. So yeah, exactly. if the patient requests the information and then finds a way to scan it into your system, then you've solved that problem. You don't need the doctors to participate. Just the patient needs to import mm. their data. Well, this is, this is about, let's say, the feasibility of the project, which there are a lot, I think, to tackle and to discuss about, and I agree. And uh, some of them, in my mind, I've tackled, and there's also in the same note that I said to you, like the initial mm. thought that I had. Um, but the question is, should I address all of these things in a seven-minute talk? Or should it be more about storytelling and making people aware that, hey, this problem actually exists. Guys, let's wake up and do something about it. You know, should, should the goal of my talk be, hey, there is this exact solution to this problem? Or should I just say, hey, like, this is an idea. Let's do something about it. You know, like an invitation to everyone. That's why I understood it. It's a competition, right? Where um, the best idea is going to go forward. So mm -hmm. you want to present your idea in a way that makes people believe that, oh, this is really possible. So, mm -hmm. yes, of course, the story is more is very important, but you also need to have a credible uh, and concrete idea. If it's just vague, people are not going to believe that actually the details are are possible. Uh, okay. Okay. Something that a lot of people forget is that actually the number one <laughs> most important thing about marketing is having a great product. If you um, have great marketing campaign, but your product sucks, your product will not sell well because the story is going to get around and the consumers will tell each other that your store product sucks. And then it doesn't matter how good your marketing is. Mm. Whereas if your product is amazing and you don't have any marketing. It doesn't matter because consumers will tell each other that your product is amazing. So the most important part of marketing is the product. <laughs> so, and okay. I think that's true, you know, in this context as well, you're marketing your idea. So the idea is actually the most important part. Okay. Interesting. So you would say more emphasis on the feasibility than well, you need to say you need to say as much as is required to establish the idea as being um, okay. credible, um, important. You know, uh, those are the the kind of criteria, and um, so the the other thing I want to say, and then we, we, I want to practice it again, is you uh, spend a lot of time telling the story about your mother. Um, but that's not something that most people will be able to relate to. So you need to be very careful about that. Um, if you can find a way to make it relatable, then uh, you can put it in. But uh, the way it is, most people will not be able to relate to it. It sounds more like a series of complaints <laughs> mm. <laughs> that most people will say, okay, you know, especially, I mean, you know, this is this kind of Dutch Germanic culture where people are like, uh, you know, okay, get over with it. Like, what do you want to do? Like, mm. It's, I think especially if you pitch an idea also like you, you can't be focused on uh, on something that seems like a complaint because then it seems like something well uh, it seems like something that you just want to solve this one problem that your mother had but you're actually not really interested in solving other people's problems right so that's why you need to have some statistics and talk mm -hmm. about how this affects other people and how you can solve a so broad social problem. Yes. Okay, so what I want you to do is do it again. I want to give you six and a half minutes um, so that you can give the whole thing. But uh, I would like you to try making a couple of these changes, but just do it on the fly. You don't need to. Okay. Um, um, okay. I'm just going to give me a few more seconds. Mm -hmm. 10, 9, 8. <laughs> sure. So the point is, you know, not to, to make it perfect, but the point is just to pra practice a lot. So that's what we're going to do now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. Ready, set, yeah. go. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wait.
okay, now, first of all, is it okay that I start with the ladies and gentlemen? Like this kind of, is it, is it too, too, like, <laughs> oh, totally fine. This is, this, I don't focus on this kind of detail. Okay, so that, that is to be fixed later, okay. And, and I think it's fine, but, but even if it wasn't, yeah. Um, it's something that actually doesn't matter. So most people, a lot of people, when they talk about public speaking, they focus on trivial things like hand positions and things like that. And I think it just yeah. doesn't matter. Like if you feel comfortable on stage and you have an important message and the story is good, people don't care about the, you know, whether you start with hello, good evening, or like can be super formal or super informal. I think it just doesn't okay. matter as long as it fits you. If you feel comfortable doing that, then you do it. Um, but but anyway, at this point, we focus more on the broad structure and the and the story, and then you can feel more com figure out what makes you feel most comfortable towards the end. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me know when I can start. Yeah, I can restart your timer. You could start now. Go. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start with two cliche questions. The first question is: How many of you here in the audience have ever traveled in your life? Yep, that pretty much is everyone. But the second question is, how many of you have ever migrated in your life? You're an international here. Yeah, you could say maybe around 30% of you. Well, that's, uh, maybe we have some bias here in Delft, but the statistics shows that in 2015 alone, more than 250 million people, 250 million people are living in a country that is not where they're originally from. What do many of these people have in common? Is that they go to a new country, they have to get adapted to a new system, including a new health system. So for example, for my case, when I entered Netherlands, I had to go to the general physician, the house arts, they call it here, and you tell your health issues to the doctor, write it down, done, you're good to go. But it's not as simple for everyone. For example, in the case of my mom, she's suffering from several health problems, uh, from back pain to asthma and many more. And in, in the cases of allergy or this kind of more critical health situation, it takes way longer for the doctors to hear your story. Every time they only have a few minutes for you to, to, to tell the problem, write it down, go back, come okay. back. I'm gonna stop you here for a second. Is it too long? Uh, no, um, I, I'm just, I'm asking myself, you're, you're creating a, you're introducing a problem about, um, you, well, you, you just mentioned every time you meet the doctor, you only have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Is that relevant to the problem that you're solving? Um, no. no. So, like, it kind of, it's kind of indirectly part of the thing that causes the problem, but you can't, you're not trying to solve that problem, right? I mean, it would be nice if doctors would say, hey, how much time do you need? Okay, I'm going to make half an hour on my schedule and we're going to talk for half an hour. But, you're not trying to solve that problem and it's probably a very difficult problem to solve. So by mentioning it, you, you kind of create a problem for yourself because uh -huh. you, 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 you've set a problem that um, you're not going to solve. Yes, so okay. People are gonna be like, oh, but what about that? What about this? So you don't want to mention that. Uh, and okay. it also doesn't carry your story across, right? So when you tell that story, it's about doing a, a, just a few steps. It's about saying, my mother suffers from a lot of health problems. When you move to another country, you have to get health checks and then the doctors have to reapprove all your diagnosis. And this mm -hmm. took a really long time. And she was, you know, suffering uh, tremendously and had even near death experiences. You can focus on that, right? Near death experiences uh, um, because of the delay in getting a new diagnosis after we moved. That's the okay. core of your message. You don't need to talk about all the details to make it uh, okay. relevant. It's, it's about, you know, mentioning what's really emotionally impactful. Well, she had near death experiences because of that. And what was the cause of that? It was taking, it was, took a long time to reevaluate the diagnosis that had already been made before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so I want to restart Very your timer and you can start that again. Sure, all right, all right. I wish I had memorized that word, all right. Good evening, so, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to start with a cliche. Let's start with two questions. Very simple one. First one, how many of you here in the audience has ever migrated, no, sorry, traveled in your life? Yeah, you could say maybe pretty much everyone. Uh, but the second question is a bit harder. How many of you have migrated in your lives? Yeah, you could see maybe a third of the people sitting here. Well, the statistics saying the same, uh, say the same thing. Um, and right now, 
there are more than 250 million people who are living outside their own country. And as a newbie to a new country, you have several problems and you have to do different things. So one of them is going to get your health checked and entering the new health system in this country. And for that, you go to the doctor, you say your problem, write it down, it's finished. But it's not as simple for everyone. For the people who have more critical health problems, they have to explain everything from the beginning. They have to make the doctors convinced uh, that they have this problem. They have, so the doctor has to reevaluate the same diagnosis that the person has already had, but in a different country. Well, and through this time, until the doctors are convinced that you have this problem, you might suffer from uh, very critical health situations. For example, for my mom, she was suffering from asthma. She had to go through several screening for a couple of months, and until then, she suffered several asthma attacks that gave her uh, a near-death experience, which is horrible to say the least. As a computer science student, I thought to myself, this, there should be a technological solution to this. We have to overcome these barriers. So I thought to myself, what if there is a digital health platform online where all your health data can be stored there and they're accessible everywhere you go, no matter your travel or migrate, your data is always with you and it's on the cloud, so you have access to it everywhere. But again, I was like, oh, this is very critical health information online. You don't want access, uh, the right people, the wrong people, excuse me, to have the access to this data. So you have to protect them. After doing some more research, I come up to a solution. It wasn't a solution for me. It's a solution that has uh, been there just quite recently. It is called blockchain. Through blockchain, you could store the data in a very efficient way, as well as having access to the data in a decentralized manner. What does decentralized mean? Let's back up for a little bit. This blockchain allows you to store the data within everyone and everybody has the access to the same data, while they cannot change the data by themselves. So that means there's not only one authority who has access to all of the data that could manipulate it or get rid of it, or something wrong could happen, but data is for everyone, but at the hand of everyone. And it is anonymized, meaning that not everybody's going to know about your health problem because they don't know the name of who has what problem, but at least everybody has the same copy of the same data. So even if it changes by a wrongdoer in one point of the world, it's not going to change for everybody else. And so how are you going to give the access of your data if you travel from here to there? I thought about biometrics. All of us have a maybe unique iris or fingerprint. So by just having a simple app on your phone, maybe you could just check your uh, fingerprint scanner and then give access to a doctor who's sitting there to the health information that has been diagnosed by a doctor somewhere else in the world. You don't have to say the story from the zero to the end again. How much time do I have? Two minutes, wow, what did I do? Um, so with that, I would like to invite everybody here to come, no matter what experience you have, no matter what background, knowledge, discipline, everybody could part, partake in making this idea possible. Let's make a digital health platform where everybody has access to their own data and they're able to share it to everyone else whenever they want and wherever they want. Thank you for your attention. I, I lost a lot of it. I lost a lot of it. I totally forgot about saying the statistics. I forgot about like making the people relate. I was... No, that's fine. So the point of practice is that you do it again and again. So. Uh, you actually did mention the statistics about the 250 million, which I, I really like that. Um, and the story was much more compact. Um, and the solution was, was you, you told it more than the, in the first one. So I, I, I think I was happy with that. I think we need to cl clarify some of that. But since you feel like you missed some stuff, I would say do it again. But you know, the reason it's so much shorter is because you just spend a lot less time talking about um, the story from your mother because we took mm. out some of the not so important part. So um, I think you, that's just fine. You don't need uh, seven minutes. You don't, you know, that was a minute that you were wasting there so, or, or, or two. So now you have mm -hmm. that back. We can figure out what to do with that. But for now, you've got um, four and a half, five minutes. So it's actually perfect. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to try giving it again straight away?
Because yeah, probably in your I mind, you've got some ideas about what to improve. Yeah, I think I could do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention yeah. is that after I had the idea, I checked online and I see that uh, the health commission from Europe Union mm -hmm. has made this the top among the top three priority right. for the health of the EU citizens in the year 2019. Right. There's so, already initiatives uh, from yeah the European Union, but I don't know how, how to put it not too long, but also... You just mentioned yeah. it. You, you say this creating an online health platform is a number one priority for the, or I don't know what it is, is a top priority for the European Union for 2019. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Sure. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Uh, should I mention about how many people have asthma? Like they're one mm -hmm. in almost one in 12 person had asthma. Is that relevant? No, I, I don't think so. Because it's uh, it's something that, like the story, if if it resonates with someone because they know someone who has asthma, they or, it already resonates. And if mm. they don't have someone who has as, knows someone, then that statistic is not gonna, really going to help them. Another one, um, there is 1.6 million car accidents that mm -hmm. involve at least an injury in Europe yep. a year. Is that is that something relevant? Like you might travel and then you would face. Uh, yeah. So what's the what's the chance that a, a, a traveler gets into a car accident? I haven't found that yet. Because okay. <laughs> I think that's, that's the more interesting one. That is more interesting, right. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, what other, I guess, yeah, car accidents are, are pretty pretty good, I guess, because that's a pretty high chance that happens everywhere. It can happen to travelers and uh, you need immediate attention. You can't be flown home. Mm. But uh, I guess the issue is that it doesn't necessarily require a re-diagnosis of an existing health condition, unless it's something that like um, interferes with a with 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 the treatment for the car accident. But that's yeah, those are details. I I, I think you can figure that out later. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna. One more time. Okay. Yeah. Ready. Yes. Set. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start with something very cliche. Two simple questions. The first one, how many of you here in the audience has ever traveled in your lives? Yeah, that's pretty much everyone. Um, let's make it a bit harder. How many of you have migrated in your lives? Maybe there are internationals here. Yeah, that's maybe around a third of the people here. Well, it's funny because in 2015 alone, there have been more than 250 million people living outside their origin country. And what do all these people have in common? Well, as, as, a, as an international, as a newbie to a country, you have to go through a lot of new systems. One of them is the new health system. When you go to the new doctor, you have to tell them about your health problems. They write it down, it's finished, and you go home. Unfortunately, it's not that easy and as easy as that for everyone else. There are some people who have more critical problems that takes a longer time to explain. But you know what's ironic is that you've already said all these problems to a different doctor, maybe in your home country or in a different country. So your problems, health problems, have been already diagnosed and there are evidences for that. Unfortunate thing is that you don't have it with you. For the people who suffer from something very critical that requires a very immediate attention and immediate medicine, that gets even harder. For example, the case of my mom, she suffers from asthma. She needs medication for that. But for her to get a medication, she had to get a doctor approve of her asthma, and then only they would get the medicine. And for that, that took more than three months for her, going through several screenings. And by then, she already had suffered for more than three times of asthma attack. I don't know if any of you have seen someone suffering from an asthma attack. It is very horrible, let me tell you that. They would experience something that is called near-death experience. They would cough their lungs out. And imagine such a situation, you just need a simple spray to solve the problem, but when you don't have that, what could happen? How many people would die every year from such situation? So as a computer science student, I thought to myself, there should be a technological solution to this already, right? 
So I checked online, there is not a universal solution. There is something called EPD in Netherlands, but it's more local, not worldwide. So what if I travel outside Netherlands? I don't have access to the data anyway. So I thought, why, what is hindering that? Actually, it's some research. It's funny because the, Europe, the Health Commission of European Union has made them on their top three priority that there should be a global or at least a EU digital health platform where if you travel or migrate from Netherlands to Germany, you don't have to bring all the data with you. It's already accessible. I did some more research. I was thinking, how could I solve this now? There should be something new, right? I mean, I'm sure maybe many of you here have heard about technology blockchain. Well, not many of us know about it in much details, but after some research, I found some great benefits in using blockchain. One of them is decentralizing data. What does decentralizing mean? Well, in normal situations, your health data is at the hand, or any data is at the hand of one single authority. And if the authority, maybe in some other countries or wrong countries, they would manipulate or use it for bad reasons, there is no way to stop them. But when your data is decentralized, means the data is at the hand of everyone. Everybody have access to their own data. One upside to this is, a one person make an edit, make a change, alteration to the data somewhere, is not going to change it on everybody else. Everybody has a copy of the data on their own. So one wrongdoer cannot change uh, information on everybody else's copy. That already gives a huge power everybody have access to their own data, and nobody can alter it. So wait, how are we going to give access to the data to the people we want? You go to this doctor, you go to that health organization, you want them to know that, hey, I have already been diagnosed. One simple way of doing that is everyone here has some unique features, biometric features. For example, your iris, your fingerprint, simple as that. I mean, all of us now we have on our phone maybe some of these biomet uh, biometric scanners. So imagine you have this digital pl platform as an app on your phone. You go to this doctor, you just check your fingerprint scanner, give access to this cer certified doctor to alter the data, to in insert new data and update it. But at the same time, they also have access to all the older data. You don't have to explain everything. So if you need an immediate attention, you need an immediate medicine, you need a new treatment, all the data is already there. So we see that it is possible. So what should we do about it? We should all, all of us here, for example, at Cute Health, as students, as professors, as business people, all of us could gather together, follow this idea, and no matter what background you're coming from, we could make this happen. I would like to invite all of you, no matter what you're doing, if you have a passion for this, if you think that everyone should have access to their own health data, I would like you to come and join me and we together could make this happen. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great, that was much better. Okay. Really nice. So uh, it's funny, you know, because you, you, you did, I didn't give you any feedback that time, uh, but you just did like a lot better. So uh, oh, nice. this, is the, this is the point, this is why I ask people to practice on their own and to practice a lot, like three times in a row, not just once and then another time a few hours later, because when you practice two times in a row, you will get immediately a lot better because in your brain, your unconscious mind is already seeing a lot of things that you can improve uh -huh. and will unconsciously improve them immediately. And then once you say it out loud, then it gets kind of saved uh, in your memory and you will be able to do it again next time. So next time. we try and do a lot of practice um, like that. Um, there's a, a few tips that I would give you. Um, uh, which I just noticed, just two small things. Um, one is I would add at the beginning a third question about who has moved within the Netherlands mm. and to ask them, you know, do, do you, uh, you have to transfer, well, just tell them that you have to also transfer your health data when you move within, within the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. and then later on, you mentioned the EPD, so you could mention that then, and you could mention at the end, you, when you mentioned EPD, you didn't mention that it was not actually in use yet, so, or, or most doctors have not implemented it yet. So you mm. have to mention that, otherwise uh, you set yourself up with a competitor that doesn't work. So, so mm. you mm. mention that EPD officially exists, but most doctors don't implement it, and it doesn't work, so because of that, it doesn't work. Um, then, um, 
this is something you need to do later. You need to um, mention why is it that your solution will work when other EPD solutions are not working. That's uh, something mm -hmm. that's, I wouldn't figure, worry about that right now as you're practicing, but that's something in the next week you have to figure that out. And then uh, the last thing I would add is you talk about like the three benefits of, of um, using blockchain. I mean, I, I would put less emphasis on blockchain because I think this is like a buzzword and pe people don't really care I, mm -hmm. whether it's blockchain or not. I would just say there's certain priorities that you want to have um, that are important for making this really useful. So you mentioned decentralization um, and you, you mentioned anonymization, but mm -hmm. I think you need to find a different word for that because anonymization um, uh, encryption of data maybe yeah it's, a, it's more about encryption right because it's um, yes it's anonymous but at the end you also need to get your data back you need to be able to prove that it's you mm -hmm. that the data is about right if it was really fully anonymous you would not be able to do that so uh, it's more actually about encryption so the data is encrypted nobody else can read your data that's that's how it is and then uh, the last part that you need to add or, or that I think is like one of the three main principles is about the, the data being certified so uh, the data no, you can't just enter your own health data and just make shit up, right? That's, you mentioned that mm -hmm. to me last time as well. So the data is entered by doctors, and so it uh, can also be, you can put markers, whether it's blockchain or any other t technology, encryption technology, you can have a, a certificate, essentially, that says who signed that piece of data when they put it in. Who, exactly, who was the person who signed exactly. That, that, so, is, that is in the list of the information that I sent you in the beginning, some of my idea, like, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you could track who is entering the data, who is... Yeah. Editing it, like all of these things can be traceable. Yeah, so, so this, that's a really important part. So um, I would mention that. So those are the, the kind of a few feedbacks that came into my head at the top of, uh, just, just as I was listening. Um, as I said, there's, um, um, you improved a lot just on that one practice. So um, I would say, go away and practice it again. Like I would like to see you practice it 10 times before our next call because, wow. you, because you will make a lot of progress when you do that. Uh, and it doesn't need to be in front of people, right? So just turn on your webcam, put a timer on for five or six minutes and mm -hmm. then just do it over and over again. It will take you 10 times. That's one hour, right? So mm -hmm. you don't need to spend that much time on it. It's just, you need to just be consistently repeating, repeating, repeating. And it, you will get better like like you just did now you repeated it twice in a row without any feedback in between and you got like twice as good um on the second run so so that's just it just works like that because you 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 consciously you don't know what makes a good talk but unconsciously your brain actually knows a lot about it so mm -hmm. you're going to teach yourself unconsciously as, as you practice wow, wow okay 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 sure um so let's put, leave it there um Obviously, you have some other things that you need to work on, your schoolwork, and um, there's some stuff about the ideas, but I would say put, take aside an hour, do it 10 times in a row, and the next time we'll be able to work with, with, a, with another level and, and, and give you some more feedback. Yeah. Is that cool? Yes, sure. Okay, so thanks. Thank you so much for your time. I really learned a lot. Thank you for the feedback, and I will work on them, and we'll see each other again. Cool. All right.